I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
God rejoice and be glad in it. So glad to be worshiping with you guys all this morning. I'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 15. And it reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the word of God for the people of God. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. As we've been preparing, the praise team's been singing, and I hope y'all don't mind, but I, I just feel like some old church, so y'all go with me. Let me do this before I get into my word today. Hey, that organ playing fine over there. One of these mornings won't be there. Oh, my God. 
but then you gotta have one of those little tunes. Thank you, thank you, brother. Right now, we're going into the Word of God. Follow me, follow me. Go into the Word of God. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Very familiar passage of scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 20. I feel like preaching now. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Maneuver over there with me, will you? You know, they got all kind of rules. What you're supposed to do while you're preaching on air and all that. Look, the Holy Spirit sometimes has to be in control. You got to do what God said to do. Deuteronomy chapter 28. When you have it, say amen. I can hear you. And we're going to begin reading at the first verse. You're going to love this passage today. You're going to begin reading the first verse. And it shall come to pass, verse 1, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of Jehovah thy God to observe to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that Jehovah God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee Watch that. And overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of Jehovah thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy beast, and the increase of thy cattle, and the young of thy flock. Blessed shalt thou be, blessed shall be thy basket, and thy kneading trough. This is the AS version of American Standard Version. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Jehovah will cause thy enemies, which rise up against thee, to be smitten before thy face. They will come against you one way, and shall flee seven different ways. Jehovah will command a blessing upon thee in the barns and in all thou puttest thy hand unto and he will bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and the Lord shall establish you a holy people unto himself for as long as the spirit of the Lord will allow we're going to speak from this thought you see it there winners no losers winners no losers come on go with me go with me 2020 has been a strange Year, but at 9.45 a.m. on January the 26th, 2020 was a tragedy of tragedies when a helicopter crashed into the side of a mountain in Los Angeles, California, and we lost a treasure in the person of one Kobe Bryant. He was only 41 years old when he died. The sports world, his closest friends, and all of us fans, have not actually come to grips with this tragedy. I mean, the death toll included not only Kobe, but his young daughter, an aspiring basketball player, Gianna, was also with her father. And seven other occupants were killed instantly, according to eyewitness reports. And I need you to know that Kobe Bryant, only 41, has a long legacy for his short life. I mean, it is filled with accolades and all kind of awards and all kind of acclaim because of what he did. And what he's known for, basically, if you watch any of the tributes, he's known for the love of his family. He's known for his winning attitude. He's known for his tenacious work ethic and how he took himself from just an average, a little above average basketball player to become one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Um, Kobe... I'm talking about Kobe because Kobe was a winner and he dubbed himself the Black Mama. <laughs> and that title came after watching Kill Bill. He said when he got on the court, he was just as focused on playing basketball as that Black Mamba was on her prey whenever she had, ever the snake had it in her sight. And so in trying to get a name for his tenacious work ethic, he called it the Mamba mentality. That was his attitude. The mama mentality. Hear what it was. He said, I'm going to win. And he had three things in the mama mentality when I was watching him talk about it. He said, first of all, there will be no excuses. He said, when you have the mama mentality, you don't make any excuses. Secondly, you expect to win. You expect to win. And thirdly, not only will you not make any excuses, but you expect to win. You do not focus on your weaknesses. That is so good. And he gave examples of that. First of all, he talked about expecting to win. 
He said, I expect to win. He said, so when I found myself aspiring to be a great basketball player, I went to the summit and I start talking to other great basketball players. You know what he did? He said, I met with the Magics and the Birds and the Michaels and the Dr. J's and the Wilt Chamberlain. He said, I looked at what they did in their career. I began to talk to them and I instilled in me that desire to win. He said, with no excuses. He recalled how there was a time when they were playing the Toronto Raptors and Vince Carter was now the hottest player in the league and his back was killing him that day, but they were fighting for a playoff spot. So you know what he did? He decided that he didn't tell his trainer, he didn't tell his coach, he just talked to his own back. He said, back today is not the day. You can go out any day you want, but today we are going to play. And then he talked about don't let your weaknesses ruin your life. So again, what was Kobe? He was a winner. And I want you to know that this text that we're in today in Deuteronomy, I know we always talk about bless, 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 but we ought to understand something. The significance of those blessings, God, the Holy Spirit just gave me this understanding of this text. He did all these blessings so that we could be winners. God does not make losers. Anytime God gets us together, he makes winners. All of us, any child of God that has been saved by God, listen to me. You've been saved to win, not to lose. He could have left you out there if you were going to be a loser. Right now, I don't know what it is you're going through, but please understand, we're going to share with you the principles in this book of Deuteronomy to show you that this 28th chapter is talking about God made us Winners. I need you to say that with me. I am a winner. I need you to understand that. Not a loser. God don't make losers. Listen to me. Losers make losers. You know how losers make losers? Those three things I just told you about what Kobe talked about. Here's why losers make losers. Because losers hang around with other losers. They don't hang around with folk who don't make, who, who are not great, who don't look for greatness. They hang around with folk who don't want anything in their life. Just like they don't want anything. Not only that, losers make excuses. Uh, they blame it on COVID-19. They blame it on their boss. They blame it on their wife. They blame it on the church. They blame it on the pastor. They blame it on everybody. Everybody's at fault except them. They make excuses. And finally, they let their weaknesses, this is a heavy one here, they let their weaknesses control and dominate their life. Think about that. They let their addictions they keep wrestling with the same addiction their whole life. Let their habits wrestling with the same habits. I'm not saying winners don't wrestle, but what I'm telling you, we wrestle to the point where we are in control of what's going on. And it doesn't make a difference how many times we have to go back and make ourselves fight off that weakness. What I'm telling you is that losers lack the stuff that winners have and God wants us to learn how to be winners and it's right here in this text. If we look at verse 13 of the text, 13 and 14, it'll ground it. It'll show you what I'm talking about. In, in verses 13 and 14 it says, the Lord will make you, you got it, the head and not the tail. He'll put you above and not beneath. All I'm telling you is this text is telling us God never made us to be on the bottom. He never made us to be the tail running around, not having our knees met, not getting blessed. The question is, do you understand you are a winner? Somebody might ask, looking at this text, so we're going to go into it. We're going to, we're going to discover that a little further. But looking at the text, somebody might ask, when did he make us a winner? I hope you're not the one asking that. And you've been in church all your life. We became winners because of the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ when he got up with his finished work you know what he did he gave us a part of his victory the victory that Christ got the resurrection victory is the victory I lean on come on you didn't think I was talking about I have strength in myself no the victory we lean on is the victory in Jesus Christ I feel the anointing coming now somebody's hearing what I'm saying how do I know that because that victory is laid out just as plain. What's the first one? The first one was the ascension of Jesus Christ. Did you get that? When Jesus left here after getting up, defeating death, hell, and the grave, he went before his disciples and they watched him as he ascended. But before he ascended, you need to go with me to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In Acts chapter 1, here's what he said. And you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Uttama, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. Listen to what I'm saying. Jesus, the last thing he said to his disciples, 
This is what makes us winners. He said, you shall receive power. That word power is the Greek word dunamis. Dunamis means that I have not only the power or divine power, I have the authority. Do you know power without authority doesn't mean anything? Now you're getting it. Power and authority go hand in hand. Look at you sitting there whining. Look at you sitting there slip, laying yourself down in all of your doubt, in all of your problems, in all of your troubles. When God said, it's not your authority, it's my power and my authority. So what you have to do is first claim the power God has because we want it on Calvary's cross. The second thing is we got to learn how to fight for it. Many martyrs died in the civil rights movement. Dr. Martin Luther King actually died in the movement, but he knew that it was time to fight. Here's a scripture, write this down. 1 Timothy 6 and 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, which you were called. Look what God said. I was called to be a fighter. I hope I'm talking to some fighters out there and real saints if they're not kidding, we'll tell you, we might look good and look like we haven't been touched, but there's a whole lot of days we are fighting just to keep our sanity. But Timothy said, we got to fight the good fight of faith. So here it is. I claim it, but I still got to fight for it. All the civil rights were already ours, but we had to have a movement to fight for it. Thirdly, you got to have courage to stand. Courage to stand. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Somebody write that down in the chat because I don't want you to miss this one. Therefore, my dearly beloved, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. See, what I'm saying is you can fight, but when the battle gets going the wrong way, do you have the courage to stand in the battle? That's what that text is talking about. I told you the 1968 Olympics in Mexico where we had um, two African-American men who actually won the gold and the silver, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. You know the scene. You've seen it. They, they stood in protest because in America, we're over there running the Olympics and trying to win medals for our country and not even have rights of our own back in America. So when they stood on that podium, they put their black gloves on and they raised their fist in the air and they knew. You think we're fighting now? over, you know, policing and all the other kind of rights you want to talk about? Do you know how unpopular that was in 1968? Time Magazine downed them. Every magazine, they were popular for the wrong reasons, but they stood in courage and raised their fist up. Now, after winning the medals, when they got back home, they got death threats. They got kicked off the Olympic team, kicked out the Olympic village. Let me cut to the chase. But many years later, they bounced back because Tommy Smith actually became a um, professor and John Carlos actually is a counselor at a high school. What am I telling you? They took the ridicule, but they got their victory because they learned how to stand. And our 44th president of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama, when he got elected, that was a miracle. That was the victory. All of us know, I don't know where you were when Barack Obama got elected, but I know I saw a lot of my senior saints, and a lot of them saying, I never thought I would see that day. But with God, there's no such thing as never. God shows us that anything can happen if we first claim what's ours, if we decide to fight for it, if we have the courage to stand, and then our miracle will happen. So that's how we became winners. But this text, you stay with me a little while longer, I'm going to show you some gems out of this text. This text is going to tell you how. I just showed you how we became. This text is going to tell you what to do to maintain being a winner and not a loser. Write these three things down. Be a winner, not a loser. First thing is winners have a godly resolve. They make a resolution within their heart that this is it, a godly resolve. Winners also have, watch this, they get godly results. Winners get godly results. You're going to see how this text is going to come alive. And winners live the blessings of a godly relationship. Let's talk about it. Book of Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy means second law or repeated writing. 
Deuteronomy is called the second law of the repeated writing because it is there that Moses was giving three speeches in the book, the structure of the book was Moses giving three speeches out on the plain one month, one month before they were to enter into Canaan land. Now watch this. So they had been in the wilderness 39 years and 11 months. Moses now gave three speeches because he was coming off the scene. And in Deuteronomy, this 28th chapter is part of that third set of speeches. Moses gave three speeches. I want you to know that. And what he was saying is the first speech was from chapter 1 to chapter 4. He said, remember God's law. He was repeating the law. Remember the things God has done for you. Remember how far God has brought you. And then the second speech was chapter 4 to chapter 26. He said he gave them details of the law so they wouldn't end up like their forefathers who ended up dying in the wilderness. And then third speech was from chapter 27 to chapter 31. And there within it is where Moses was designing or telling them or defining God's covenant relationships that you could have blessings, watch me, or curses according to your mentality and whether you were following God. You got to know, he said, after you got done speaking, he said, y'all need to follow Joshua. But here's what he said. There's a, there's a covenant with God. You've been running around the wilderness 39 years and 11 months. It's time for you to get your promised land. I don't know. Moses was talking to the children of Israel. I'm talking to somebody out there. Haven't you been losing long enough? Haven't you found yourself crying, fighting, fearful long enough? Then understand you are a winner. And the first part of this text tells us how to become winners. I know. I'm getting animated, but that's who I am. You need to understand that God made me a winner, and I refuse to go down. I refuse to allow my life to be lost because I won't accept the mantle of what God has placed in front of me. God makes winners, not losers. Come on, we're going to the first part. It says, if you hearken diligently. If you, if you fully obey the Lord's commandments, he will make all these promises come over you. Boy, we don't like that word obey. Even saying it, it sends cringes up somebody. But you need to understand that this text starts off talking about the number one person, reason people walk around losing more battles then they should lose and not winning when they should win. Here's why. Because in this new religion we got, you want to always put the cart before the horse. Uh, you want to count your chickens before they hatch. You want to go around, get all excited in the anointing and start claiming stuff and start telling God to bless this and I want this. And all of a sudden, you're trying to claim something you're not ready to sacrifice for. You're claiming stuff you didn't live with. You're claiming stuff you never lived or sacrificed or held out to get. All you're doing is claiming it. And the reason you can't get it is because there's two words in that first verse that tells us what God expects. The first one is if. If is a big word. If, if, the word if, here's what God is saying. You can't run around saying, I'm going to get some blessings if you don't understand the word if. Here's what if is. If is a conjunction that always leads to a conditional clause. Did you get that? If is a conjunction. It's right there. It'll send you in one direction. It pulls two things together. It'll send you in one direction or the other direction. You got to make out, but there's a condition you have to meet in order to understand what he is saying. And I can easily illustrate the principle of a conditional clause in this coronavirus era. Here it is. If you don't put on your mask, you cannot go into a store. Matter of fact, I saw one sign that says, no mask, no shopping. All it's saying is, if you don't want to meet the condition, you can't get the things that you need. And so God is saying here in this text that some of y'all don't understand that God is saying if and you got to obey or you can't be the winner because you won't meet the condition. And I'm tired because I hear my folk out there. So let me get theological on you. Some people try to tell me that we don't, we don't have to worry about the Old Testament. We are under the New Testament, under grace. We've never been under a religion, under a God that does not hold us accountable for our actions. Yeah, we got grace, but we're not to abuse that. Here's what people say. We, we're not under the Old Testament and the law. We are 
remember the New Testament. I don't know why that preacher preaching that. Because you need to understand something. Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come to fulfill them. Jesus did away with partial sacrifices, shed his precious blood. That's why I'm standing on the premise that we are winners. What am I telling you? You can't go into the New Testament and find one promise that does not have a condition attached to it. Let's look at a few. The first one is forgiveness. The Bible tells us, Matthew 6, 14, 15, Jesus said himself, he said, unless you forgive people who sin against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins because you don't forgive them their sins. It's very simple. God said you can ask for forgiveness and it's your right under the new covenant. But you can't get it if you hold grudges against other people. You can't get the devil off your back without making a condition. You can't walk around saying, get me behind me, Satan. And you're not willing and ready to do what the scripture says. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, submit yourselves unto God. Watch this. Resist the devil and he will flee. Y'all missed the resisting part. Everybody want to say, get me behind me. Nobody wants to stand up and resist him. There's the condition. If I don't resist him, he's going to override me. Somebody just learn something right now. You ought to get to your house, get to your secret closet, get on your knees. I'm sorry, you're already at your house. Get on your knees and say, devil, get out of my house. And then resist him. He may send all kind of crazy thoughts through your mind. And Come on, I'm not the only one that knows there is real spiritual warfare. And then finally, here's the one I love. Healing. Remember John chapter 9 when Jesus ran into the blind man and they asked him, who did sin? John's gospel chapter 9. This man or his parents. And anyway, Jesus went up to the man and spit on the ground, washed his eyes and said, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's not the most important part, the spit and what Jesus did. The most important part, the text says, so the man went and washed and came seeing. Did you see it? He met the condition. He'd have just been walking around with mud on his eyes if he did not meet the condition to go wash because Jesus said to go wash. And that's how he got his blessing. What I'm telling you is that we have to resolve to meet the condition. We, we're not trying, you know, uh, when I got married, I didn't say my vows uh, as a covenant. We're talking covenant now. I didn't say my vows as if, well, this don't work. I'm just going to leave. Now, don't think I'm talking about divorce people because I'm not. Because watch this. It said, for richer or poorer, for better or worse, in sickness and health. But listen to this. Whenever I counsel a couple, I ask both of them, are you ready to honor your covenant? That's right. I'm helping somebody out. I'm not talking about you if your situation fell apart because the, in order for a covenant to work, both parties have to meet their desire. So if there was no love and respect, then you weren't holding up that covenant. But I'm just proving this point to tell you there's a condition and you have to resolve in your heart. That's all I'm going to live by is the condition. Then the next one was obey. I love this one. He said, and obey. First Samuel chapter 15. You know the text. Jesus had sent Saul. God had sent Saul to go and destroy the Amalekites, or Amalekites, I'm sorry, Amalekites, and he bought back King Agag, and God told him to destroy everything, and when Samuel showed up, Samuel asked Saul, why did you not do what God said? And Saul said, I did carry out the work of the Lord, and Samuel said, no, you did not. He said, uh, well, we kept some of the best sheep and the people and the people. We were going to offer them for sacrifice. I love this verse. Write it down. He said, do you think the Lord delights in burnt offerings more than sacrifices? God would rather have obedience than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Somebody asked me why. I'll tell you why. You can run around, serve God till you're tired. I don't care. You have to run yourself down till you have to go to the doctor, get some vitamins, all of that. But if you are not being obedient in your walk, it does not mean a thing. Why? Because obedience, here it is, 
Disobedience, excuse me, is sin and rebellion. Disobedience means that you want to look good in front of others more than you want to look good in front of God. Disobedience means that you're not sold out on God's majesty and his power. How do I know? Because when I was growing up, I know I'm going to get some amens right here. We got beatings by our parents. That's right. I'm telling it. And some of y'all who know what beatings are, we had no time out. Well, no, go sit down somewhere and do time out. I know y'all do time out and all this other stuff now. Well, no counseling. No, they told you, here's our time out. Go get my belt. You got five minutes to get it. Go outside and give me a switch. His time out, our time out was my parents. And we knew when we walked out there mumbling and crying. And, oh, you know what's going on? You got that switch. And here's why. Because deep in your heart, you knew your parents had a right to beat you, to chastise you. Why? Because they took care of you. You were living in their house. They bought your clothes. They fed you. They were the authority over you. Well, if you do it for parents, how come you can't trust God? How come you can't believe God? Here's what I believe. I believe some of us have missed the blessings of God because we don't know that being obedient would set us free. Oh, listen to me. Being obedient would bring the thing that I'm trying to get. Not long ago, I went to the store. And I remember going out, and I was buying a lot of things. I was at Home Depot, and I'm buying some stuff. And I remember the night before, I don't carry my wallet in my back pocket. So I always put my wallet in the glove compartment in the car. But we were walking around, I gave my wallet to my wife. I do that sometimes. We're trying to get stuff out. I'll just say, hold this for me. I had given her my wallet. So when we got home that night, went to bed, whatever we did, I got the next morning, I'm going to Home Depot. I'm standing in line. I got about $25 in my pocket. The stuff came to like 70 some dollars. And I start thinking, oh, Lord, I left my wallet in Marsha's pocketbook. So I remember I just didn't even, didn't even put stuff on the counter. Just I, as I was sitting there looking at stuff, I said, oh, my God, put everything back, got in the car, went home, decided I'll come get it later. When I got to the house, Come on, y'all, you won't be as mad as I was. When I got to the house, I looked, I thought I was putting something in the middle of the black apartment. There was my wallet. I don't know. I guess I had put it there and didn't remember. Here's the part I'm trying to get you to see. I lost out because I didn't know it was there. A lot of times you don't know what God has for you because you haven't been obedient enough for him to show you. So I lost out a whole half a day because I did not know. How much of your life have you lost? Maybe that last sickness is because you're not obedient. Maybe the chronic illness is because you won't surrender totally to God. And then he said, all, he said, all these blessings will come on you and overtake you. I love this. We're still talking about if winners resolve. Here's what winners do as I go into the second point. Second point is winners get godly results. You will be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed uh, when you go out, blessed when you come in. Your sheep will be blessed. Your cattle will be blessed. Here's what God said. Because you were obedient, you will be blessed. Can I tell you some of the doors that obedience opens up for blessings in your life? I know we just saw this text is talking about blessings everywhere and blessing you with everything. Read it yourself. Blessed in the city. Blessed in the country. Blessed when you go out. Blessed when you come in. The word blessed there is the Greek word markios. Markios. And it means to be fortunate or favored by God. That's right. Somebody, there's a shout right there. The only reason your blessing has come in your life, you've been favored by God. It's a setup. God already favored you to get the things you need. And you know what? You can look back in your life and see times you should have gone under. You would have gone under. But God's favor was in your life. And that favor, that Markios blessing, that fortune of God. Divine blessing of God, the power of God came into your life and preserved you. And when you see all of these blessings, I love this because it tells us that we get the benefits of God and the blessings of God. Here's what happens when I walk in those blessings. I learn something. Here's what, here's what winners do. Winners say, life is not fair, but God is faithful. See, we don't sit around whining because life isn't fair. I, if you never heard it anywhere else, I'm going to tell you, life ain't fair sometimes. 
The things in life are not fair. But don't just get it backwards. Some of your blessings aren't fair. But life is not fair. But we just believe that God is faithful. What I mean by that is that uh, David said in Psalms 27, um, uh, verse 13, uh, around 13 and 14, he said, I would have fainted, King James, if I had not believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. What am I saying? Is that, yes, life is not fair, but the reason I hold on is because God is faithful and he's never proven me wrong yet. Here's something else winners learn. Every time I fall, I get back up. That's right. You're not the only one that fall. You're not the only one that have, can lay claim to how bad things are. Here's what winners do. We find a way to get back up no matter what's happening in our life. As a matter of fact, when we get back up, it's because God somehow is pulling us up by the goodness of what he's put in our life already. And when I fall down or the devil knocks me down, and, and I know some of you, you know, you're so holy you never admit it. You ever met one of them kind of holy people that they so holy to speak in tongues, they do all this stuff, so they never fell off the wagon of holiness? You know, they never messed up. I can't say that. There are weeks sometimes when, I don't want to say whole weeks, I'm going to quit preaching. There are times when I fall off the wagon, but I hold on because I'm getting up. I'm not going nowhere. Y'all know what I'm saying? Somebody out there is praising God with me. There are times I have not been faithful, but you know what? When I fall down, I get back up and say, Lord, if you still want me. I'm still coming. And then what else winners learn? Write, write this down. We get aggressive in adversity. Winners decide to be bolder in bad times. Pray harder. Sing more. Read more. Bless God more. In bad times, we decide to hold on. Matter of fact, James said it this way. I count it all joy. And then we find out winners never quit, but they climb higher. What that means is, as runners, we learned a long time ago that if we are to, if we fall down, climbing higher means this, uh, uh, to stop. Can you imagine somebody sitting there stop and quitting? They just sit down, they quit on God, and they just have sat down in their misery. But what we decided is when real trouble comes, climb higher, it takes more energy, but I'll get more blessed. Runners do that. It's a runner's technique. We, we run even, nice pace on even ground. But when the hills come, we dig in. And then we know the other side of the hill we're going to have. We won't lose any ground because we'll keep pace. So we need to understand that you have to have a result. Winners also, I just told you, have to make sure that they understand the godly results is we will be blessed. It's a setup. Our family will be favored. Verse 7 tells us to set up will be blessed in warfare. The Lord will grant that your enemies who come in one way will have to lead in seven different directions. Spiritual warfare is no joke. Spiritual warfare means there are real obstacles, mental, emotional, physical, um, financial, uh, family, all kind of warfare. And anybody worth their salt will tell you, I have had to have weeks or days where i just been fighting, but somehow the Lord blessed me. But you need to know that God will teach us to stand our ground because that's the verse where the Lord tells us that um, the Lord will send a blessing so that our enemies has to run from us because we learn how to stand on ground because we've already won, because we're stronger. We're talking about the results of being a winner. What are the results? David walking out to a Goliath saying, I'm going to cut off your head. Why? David had a winner's attitude. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego sitting in the fiery furnace saying, if it be so, I don't have to carefully answer you. I'm already a winner. Somebody's got this. Or Moses at the Red Sea saying, stand still. See the salvation. I hope I'm helping somebody today. I hope you understand something. you got to learn how to stand still and believe I'm going to win. There are no losers in God. Let me go to my last point. Not only must you resolve, godly resolve. This is it. I'm not trying anything else. God is my source. Then you must also understand godly results. But then you must have a godly relationship. Winners live a godly relationship. Right there in the text. Verse 9. The Lord will establish you as his holy people. Then we get down to verse 13, 14. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you pay attention to this command, you'll be above and not the knee. 
Some of you don't live a godly relationship because you don't live a relationship of following his commands. And please don't, don't turn me off yet. Listen to this. This is important. Some of you are losing because you have a casual relationship with God. Casual is, I don't live too bad. I'll show up in church sometimes. I'll carry a Bible. I'll talk a little Christian talk. And some of you out there, you're not really saved. Just talk the Christian talk. If I see God, good. If I don't see God, good. Just so casual. Others of you have a collaborative relationship with God. Here's me tell God, Lord, you solve some of my problems. Some of my problems, I want to solve. I don't like the way you solve them. So your relationship is, God, some stuff I want you to leave alone. God said, no, I am your Lord. So when you tell me you want to live collaboratively, that means you don't want to follow me or be obedient. Somewhat casual, somewhat collaborative. Here's what it. Some other people, not only do you want casual and collaborative, some of you actually want God to be your collateral. You know when you find God? When you got a need. Uh, uh, I prayed and God met my need. But did you live for him afterwards? When you have a relationship with God that he's just your collateral, that means that you just put him up and, and you just think, you know, God, I only need you when I'm hurting. But then there's the rest of us in this text. We have a critical relationship. You know what a critical relationship says? I know I can't make it by myself. You know why I still serve God? I don't care anything about COVID-19. I don't care if I'm Sumanic. I don't care what comes. I'm going to hold on to God. You know why? Because I found out how critical I am. I'm in a critical condition. My sin has put me on life support. I can't have a casual relationship because I need him every day. Is there anybody like me that know this is the day the Lord has made? I need to get up in the morning and have God on my side. I can't have a collaborative relationship because I found out what Isaiah said. All of my righteousness is as filthy rags. I don't have anything to add to this relationship. But thank you, Lord. And I can't have a collateral relationship because I got nothing to put up but my sin and my trial and my trouble. But I have a critical relationship because I realize that if God had not been there to rescue me, I don't know where I would have been. He made my life so much better. So we believe, as I close this message, we believe tonight that right now, today, wherever you are, whenever you get to hear this message, on this Sunday morning, I want you to figure something out. I want you to know that he made your life much better. You are a winner and not a loser. And the first thing you need to do is get up out of your pity. I'm not making light of your trouble. I've seen real trouble, real sickness, real problems, real struggles. But here is what God said. Winners, no losers, praise out of trouble. You know what I found out? Praising God brings. That winning attitude. We're looking at this text and just say, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Blessed going in and blessed going out. I'm just blessed. So that means I cannot be a loser. And I hope somebody, my sister, my brother, you can't be a loser. You belong to God. There was a woman who came to her doctor, Dr. Crane, and said, I want a divorce. He was a psychologist and she said, We don't try counseling. Right now, I, I done took all I can take. I want to hurt him. So I'm going to leave him. And the psychologist said, well, I got a proposition for you. You know how you're really getting? Take the next month and start sending him compliments and start talking nice to him and worshiping, you know, make him feel like, you know, you're back in love with him. And then at the right time, lower the boom and divorce him. You'll hurt him for real. And she said, I like that. Well, time came for the next appointment. She said, doctor, everything is going as you said. I did just what you told me to do. The doctor said, well, okay, according to our notes, it's time for the divorce. She said, divorce? She said, wait a minute. I have not loved him any more than I love him now. It seemed like when I started praising, our relationship became better. Oh, don't miss it. You're a winner. You need to know the source of your winning. If you decide to take me up on this message this week, and it's a powerful one, tag somebody, send it to somebody. I need you to touch all your friends. Because
because you need to let them know we are winners no matter how long this virus lasts, no matter how many, how much trouble we come up against. God does not make losers. And if we will hearken, obey fully, the Bible actually tells us all these blessings will run us over. I'm done. Praise God. You're a winner. Start telling yourself that. Start praising the God that made you a winner. What the winners do? They have a godly resolve. That's it. I'm with God. What the winners do? They get godly results. I can look back and see my blessings. What else the winners do? They live a godly relationship. I want no casual relationship. Lord, I need you always. Every day, I need you. Thank God for you tuning in this week. This is Pastor Duncan saying, please join us. Wednesday nights, I'm doing a fantastic series in the power of our favorite psalms. Come on, go to our website, check it out. Go to our Facebook, check it out. And you will find out. And we really need you to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Shiloh Baptist TWO. If you want to see some of the great things we're doing in the church, tune in. I spent my time right now. I want to thank God for all of my, my team that's working here today. But most of all, I hope this word got into your spirit. And when you leave, when you leave this place from watching this ministry, that you say, I'm a winner. God doesn't make any losers. God bless you. Talking to him and leave it there. I was down, but with the no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.